On behalf of the Shram family, Sandy, and Keith, Diane, Nick, Cecilia, Melissa, David, Freya, I know it's going on forever, isn't it? Welcome and thank you for joining us today as we celebrate the extraordinary an astounding life of Ken Schramm. I'm Beverly Graham. We are going to take you on a journey today with music and stories, pictures, video, and reflection. We will share laughter because laughter is healing, especially when we are looking into the face of mortality. We will share our grief and our tears because that is something that connects us here today and we have to move that energy. And when we've dried our tears, we will reach deep and share our faith and our hope because that's what we do as human beings. We always look for the rainbow. And we always wonder what is on the other side. Ken Schramm loved life. 
He loved to shock us. He encouraged us to think and to feel, to get involved, to participate. Sometimes he helped us reaffirm our own convictions and perceptions, and sometimes he just made us mad. He lived completely inside of his own skin. He loved fully. His beautiful wife, Sandy, the love of his life. He loved more than life. One of Seattle's great love stories. He adored his children and was so proud of them. And he was putty in the tiny hands of his granddaughter, Freya. Not a perfect guy, audacious, tenacious. Some people called him ornery, <laughs> opinionated. Sometimes with a belligerent and irreverent, don't blow smoke up my ass attitude. He shook us out of our apathy. And even if we did not agree with him, he invited us by saying, come join the dance with me. Every day he marched fiercely and gleefully towards becoming fully anthropos, fully human. And he encouraged each of us to do the same thing. Ken blessed this universe, as we all do, just by being. So today we're going to begin this part of the journey with a blessing and a benediction by Ken's dear friend, Paul, and his wife, Linda, Reverend. O oh God, creator of us all, I know that you and Ken are smiling down on us as we gather to celebrate Ken's life. Bless us as we mourn the loss of Ken's physical presence among us. Comfort us as we tell stories, laugh, and cry together. Help us be a community of love and support for Ken's family. And when we go from here later, Hold each of us in the palm of your hand, together with Ken. Yeah, doing a benediction for Ken Schramm. <laughs> That's almost an impossible task. Because he would say, well, um, you earned it, you deserved it, you know, Rev. So bleep, bleep, get up there and do it. <laughs> and bleep, bleep, keep it short. <laughs> you know what the bleep, bleeps are. <laughs> but not impossible. Because Ken touched so many lives, a blessing in his own way. We all know that Ken could be a bit crusty. Um, that's an understatement. But I think just as God created that crusty, brusque, blunt, make it plain type of speech and style. I've been a lobbyist down in Olympia for many years and <laughs> I can remember once when Ken came down a few years ago and the legislators that had gotten word of it made sure they were either on the floor or in a cubicle or in their office or someplace off the Capitol campus. <laughs> but just as God created that crusty person of Ken Schramm, God also, we all know, right, created a warm, loving, generous, 
heart in Ken that was a blessing to Sandy, Diana, David, Keith, Nick, and by all means, little Freya Jane, and to so many in Como land and beyond. Now, the second part of my benediction, blessing, sharing, I ought to catch a headline in tonight's news. Any newscasters here at all? Any cameras? And that is that I believe that Ken Schramm is the head of God's crusty angel contingent in heaven, <laughs> in that rainbow. Because I believe God has a variety of teams of angels according to the personalities that he has created. <laughs> crusty angels, God said, Ken, you are in charge of this group. That blessing that I'd like to, to share that, that Ken gave to us, that I'm re gonna refer to as my, my final part up here. Uh, where, I don't know where Eric Johnson is, but uh, you all have seen, and I think we're gonna see it on the screen again in case you haven't, but I happen to watch, be watching the TV right after the announcement of, of Ken's death. That beautiful, touching video segment, whatever you want to call it, that Eric had, a, I think, a pretty significant hand in. Clips from Ken's amazing broadcast career, and at the very end, at the very end, Ken says, besides, be safe out there. He said something from me being a, quote, rev and minister is really gospel. And those are the words where he said, as I recollect them, take good care of each other. That's the crux of what I want to say this to all of you. Because we know that it's a beautiful world out there, but we know that it's also a very broken world. Thank you, Ken, for sharing your life with myself and Linda and with all of us. Let us take good care of each other. Ken got the last laugh with me. He knows I'm a backstage person. He was front and center stage. My mouth is dry, my armpits are sweaty, my knees are knocking, and I'm speaking to this group of folk. I mean, Ken, you got me. But to Sandy, Keith, Nick, Diana, and the rest of the Shram family, this is a truly heartwarming turnout, and may you find comfort with all of us who are here today. I certainly do. I believe that the final chapter of Ken Shram's biography has not been written yet. And although I'm not the one to do it, I would like to suggest a few chapters. The first one would be that rough, Bronx veneer that we all saw covering that warm, compassionate soul of his who made him who he actually was. The next chapter would find him chasing after Sandy, <laughs> who would become the love of his life and he the love of hers. He became a great television and radio personality and journalist, as you know, no surprise there, but he became a greater dad and a greater husband. And it didn't take me long to realize that Ken wouldn't commit to any social obligation without checking with Sandy first, even if it meant catching a beer after work. And when I asked him about it, I mean, dude, what's up with that? He said, oh, no, 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 I don't go to the bathroom without checking with Sandy first. <laughs> now, having worked with him for 35 years, I love seeing Ken, the practical joker, who gave nicknames to just about everyone that he worked with. Mine was Fred, because when I suffer from severe back pain, which seems to be more often than not, I tend to walk like Fred Sanford from Sanford and Son. <laughs> I gave him the nickname Grady, who was Fred's best friend. <laughs> Grady, as you know, was a walking set of contradictions. He was a hard worker who made it look easy. He loved sports, especially baseball, hated basketball. He hated basketball for a very unique reason. 
he couldn't stand the sound of sneakers on the hardwood. That squeaky, squeaky, squeaky would drive him insane. Now, what kind of sense does that make? When you attended a Mariners game with him, you had to submit to his rules. Leave early enough to find a free parking spot on the streets of Seattle. <laughs> Fill up on street vendor hot dogs walking to the stadium. <laughs> and most importantly, Sandy, Keith, Nick, Diana, he always went opening day and more with the family. Never, ever leave the game before it's over, no matter how cold it is, no matter what time of night it is, and no matter what the score is. <laughs> now, politically, you know, he hated uh, gridlock in Washington, D.C., uh, the toxic discords in Congress, and the vitriol between neighbors when they were discussing politics in the gridlock. And he didn't mind telling you as much. And when he was on air, he had the capacity to piss you off with the speed of a particle accelerator. <laughs> Yet, he was respected and respected those whose opinion were different from his. He was a contrarian to the core. But the way you got him to do what you wanted him to do was to give him the opposite argument. And speaking of opposites, to a certain extent, Grady and I were polar opposites. He loved country and rock. I loved jazz and soul. He was extroverted. I'm introverted. He was a rebel. I'm more of a diplomat. As I said, he was front stage, center, stage front and center. I'm backstage. Yet we were like brothers. And the guy had the ability to make you feel as though you and only you had that special connection to him. And truth be told, I got the feeling sometimes that my mother liked him better than me. <laughs> and she'd only met him once. <laughs> we give each other a hard time about this, that, or the other, but deep down, just knowing that he was right down the hall from me made all the difference in my professional world knowing he was a phone call away, made my day-to-day -day life re reinforced. Ken honored me by calling me his friend. As you can imagine, working with Grady could be an adventure at times. Here are a few comical chapters. Just about every morning, my phone would ring and I would hear, smoking them up, boss, smoking them up. He smoked. I'm a secondhand smoker trying to stand up when from the, from the smoke. Well, on this one occasion, we were on uh, a deck facing the Space Needle, four floors above Sport Restaurant. And just about the time he finished his second cigarette and flicked the butt out, an unexpected gust of wind caught it and carried it directly onto a Charlie's Produce truck as it was making a delivery, which wouldn't be a big, big deal except the truck had a canvas top. <laughs> we took off like two 12-year-olds. <laughs> then there was a time not long ago that the chairman of Fisher Communications, the chairman of the board, Phelps Fisher, stopped by Ken's desk to tell him how unhappy he was with one of Ken's commentaries. After a bit of going back and forth, Ken stopped him and said, Phelps, I'm going to speak slowly and loudly. <laughs> You're so wrong. <laughs> but one of the best days of his life had to be June of 19, 19, hello, <laughs> 2012, when he threw out the first pitch at a Mariners game. Um, John Carlson, the other commentator when that show was on Como Radio, planted the idea in, uh, in the Mariners organization, and lo and behold, it, it came to fruition. The M's asked him what number he wanted on a customized jersey that they were going to give him with his uh, name on the back. He says, 11. Manners say, oh, so you're a big Edgar Martinez fan, huh? He goes, no, 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 that was son, Keith's uh, number when he played um, Little League. Oh, okay. Well, that was partially true, but what he told me was that he really was a big Edgar fan, but he didn't want to admit it in front of the Mariners. Well, as luck would have it, I have a contact that works with Edgar, so I called her and asked that Edgar send a special good luck email to Shram. Edgar was kind enough to do it, and it said in part, hey, Shram, I hear you're throwing out the first pitch next week. Don't embarrass my number. <laughs> Ken suspected I was behind it, but I never, ever let on. 
But the incident that got most attention probably was the week that he gave the shrammy to the head of the Washington State Department of Corrections. Now, the, the, the commentary in and of itself was brilliant, although the delivery of the shrammy left a lot to be desired. It um, arrived at DOC in basically a plain brown wrapper, coffee stains, and no return address label on it. <laughs> Rather than forward it to the head of DOC, the mailroom clerk called the Washington State Patrol bomb squad, which led to the water cannon blowing up the package, which led to, I should say first, evacuation of the building, which led to news coverage. Everyone thought it was a, pretty much a funny ordeal, except the guy that it was intended for. And when, when Ken found out who actually mailed it, he kept it to himself. Now, AP picked up this story. It went coast to coast. It went viral. The headline read, Bobblehead evacuates DOC. <laughs> but Ken took full responsibility, and to this day, only a handful of us know who, who the Unabomber actually is. <laughs> so, no, I say the last chapter of Ken's biography hasn't been written. And when you stop and think about it with Kathy Gertzen helping St. Peter up in heaven, meet the new folks that are coming, and with Ken passing out nicknames to those new folks, and with Bill Strothman documenting their events, there just have to be more chapters of Ken and the gang. So Grady, I'm signing off now. Your friend, Fred. Chris Rom. Uh, Ken and I started at Como about the same time, but we didn't get hooked up as a team until 1982. Como was starting a special projects unit, and Ken was going to head it up. And uh, there was an opening for photographer editor, and um, I was a really green shooter at the time, and uh, I applied for it. And Ken took a chance on me. I couldn't believe it, um, and really it really was a uh, defining moment in my career. Um, it would really start a 33-year friendship. And uh, Ken and I uh, here recently tried to figure out how many editorials we shot together, and it was close to 2,000. Uh, we did documentaries, we did specials, town meeting. And he, he was the boss, um, the best boss you could have. He, he fought for me, you know, and, and uh, I'll never, never forget it. Um, and, uh, responding to the uh, nicknames, um, I had over 70 interns uh, when I worked at Como, and almost all of them, their very first experience with TV was going out with SRAM. <laughs> and so he, he would always give them a nickname, of course, a unique nickname. There was Doug Irvine, who became Doug Funny, you know, the cartoon character. And then we had the two Darrens, um, Tegman and Worthington, who became Wally and Jerry Mathers for Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> and then Wayne White was Wayne's World. Um, but Ken was very instrumental on, on how I treated these interns. Uh, he taught me to give them every chance, uh, every opportunity to succeed. And many of them did. And some of them are here. And um, I just want you to know that Ken was, was very proud of you, you know, as I am. Ken was a friend of law enforcement. He loved cops, and he used that to his advantage. When we were late for a shoot, he would insist on driving. <laughs> he, he exceeded the speed limit. He illegally used the express lanes. He drove the wrong, wrong way on one-way streets. And he didn't get pulled over very often, but uh, when he did, he would, you know, the cop would come up and smile, and, oh, Ken Schramm. I love town meeting. And they'd, you know, say, how you doing? And we went on our way. Never, never got a ticket. And I know Sandy, uh, it bugged her because it happened to her a few times, too. And then if we uh, were, had a shoot downtown and we were, like, 
by the market and we needed a place to park, I would just pull up in the middle of the intersection, Ken would roll this window down. How you doing? Oh yeah, and pretty soon we were parked front, front row. You know. um, as some of you may know, Ken liked coffee now and then. And I had never heard of a quad before uh, until I met Ken. He drank them like water. So you can imagine uh, how happy he was when Larry opened his espresso stand, his brother Larry, out on Lake City Way. He'd, uh, he'd start his morning, he'd drink his pot of coffee at home, then he'd go uh, stop off at Larry's and get his quad. And then when we went out on shoots, um, we would always go to Larry's uh, immediately when we left the station out on Lake City Way. It didn't matter if we were going to Olympia. <laughs> we'd, we'd hit, so we always had to figure in the extra time. There were so many stories and uh, so many shram-isms. You know, if, if you dared to speak up when he was talking, you know, you might hear, if I want anything out of you, I'll use a plunger. <laughs> was one of his big ones. Or his infamous, I, I can't say these, but you line sack of beep, 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 beep. <laughs> Now, if he was fond of you, and he was in a good mood, you might hear, numbnuts. How you, how you doing, numbnuts? And um, so he, he felt good about that. He taught me uh, how to be patient um, when you get even for a practical joke. And as many of you know, he, he could spend years getting even. Um, you know, we did life together, and we raised our kids together. Um, and he taught me that family was more important than work. And Sandy, um, Ken taught me how to love my wife because he loved you um, unbelievable. And it really helped me. And, and Keith and Nick and Diana, Freya, he taught me um, to spend as much time as you possibly can with your kids while you can and your grandkids. Um, when I visited Ken a couple weeks ago um, in the hospital, he was on life support and couldn't speak, and his eyes were closed. And I, I went up to him, and I held his hand, and I said, no, this is Chris. And he kind of nodded, you know, he knew it was me. And I said, I love you, Ken. And he nodded again. Um, you know, and we never had said that to each other before, and uh, I really wished I had. Kenny was the type of guy I loved in the newsroom. He was old school cool, dynamic, intelligent, wickedly witty, and passionate. Passionate about his job, passionate about our community. But mostly, he was passionate about his family. Sandy, he adored you. Keith, Nick, and Diana, he was your biggest fan. As I got to know Ken, as we became friends, I realized what an amazing guy he truly was. On camera, he was brash, funny, argumentative. Off camera, he was all of that. But if you knew Ken, you knew he really cared. I loved how he greeted each day with enthusiasm and how he greeted so many of us with the nicknames he bestowed upon us. Standing before you now are frat boy, Randoon. <laughs> and I was beast master. <laughs> The target of many of his epic practical jokes, that includes the day I arrived at work to find Ken had stolen my computer keyboard, my mouse, my phone receiver, my stapler, and a few other things from my desk. He individually wrapped them in plastic and then submerged them in a huge tub of jello, <laughs> which I eventually found in the lunchroom fridge. That's why my nickname for Ken was Evil Doer. <laughs> so, Evil Doer, you kept us on our toes. You kept a tough job fun. You had a heart deeper and wider than the Grand Canyon. You were my friend, and you will be missed. Try not to read this, but I have to say, channeling boss, the, he's boss a lot. But his big thing was channeling for his script, and that's kin speak for memorizing the script. I don't know who he was channeling, but 
He was really good at it. Does anyone here have an older brother? You know, occasionally annoying, right? Yeah, yeah that's... And you love him anyway. Ken was that older brother to me. He was more than just a friend. He was, he was a brother. You know, he cheered me through my successes, my family. He pushed my buttons big time, always. He really patiently talked me through tough times. And we both had several when we worked together. You know, he, he was a guy he never judged. He was his own man. He loved you no matter what. And Chris, I was able to tell him I loved him. And I was so happy. You know, it's, it's funny, Shrambo, that's our nickname for him. I called him Kenny, Shrambo, all kinds of things. He was part, he was a part of magician and he was part of comedian. He had a wicked sense of humor and he entertained us and surprised us, opened our eyes. But he was also about having fun. You know, he, he poked people's, people's egos and he loved everybody around him and he showed it every day no matter how much he tried to piss you off. You know, it's funny, I, I wish everyone could have walked the streets with Ken Shram. He had a segment called Shram on the Street. And, you know, literally he walked the streets. He delighted in jaywalking. He loved that. Especially when he knew that I didn't. I hated it when he did that. Well, anyway, one day, you know, he takes off across the road as soon as I park, and I go over to the light, to the crosswalk, and the light's especially long, and I'm waiting. Light changes. I finally make it across the street to the coffee table that he's always sitting at. And he's, he's already there, has his cup of coffee, and he has, you know, whatever the heck he would buy me, some fizzy thing. <laughs> and he'd look at me with a straight face and say, are you ready yet? <laughs> You know, knowing that, come on, Ken. Ah. You know, he always bought the coffee, and he always gave his time to everyone on the street who walked by, everybody. Especially a homeless person came by. He would always give a little bit of himself, and, you know, some money. But he always, always gave everybody a hug. That was Kenny. You know, he shared everything with the people not just on television, on the streets with his family. You know, he, I call him the Bronx kid occasionally. He was comfortable with kings of business and politics and knew who he was and wasn't afraid to let us know. Ken showed me the value of standing up for my principles and not to play games, to tell it straight. And he would want all of us, I think, to continue his mission of right over wrong, whatever version that is. He would want us to question, to agitate, and especially annoy. He was good at that. But I just, I love Ken Schramm, and he was certainly my brother, and I'll miss him. You are the love of my life. Ken said that to Sandy almost every day for 44 years. It's important to remember. In, 1988, I, in 1998, I landed a job at Como. Came home, and one of my first assignments was with Mr. Schramm. And I walked up and introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm Jim. And he goes, hi, you're the FNG. And I go, FNG? And he goes, and I can't say it, friggin' new guy. I went, well, you know, that must mean you're the FOG, because I've been watching you since I was a little kid growing up in Issaquah. <laughs> Friendship was born. <laughs> My favorite shoots were going out with Ken on the street, like Randy said. We'd pull up, and I'd get out my gear, and he'd go in, and he'd get a tall drip. And then he'd come back with an Italian soda. 
And he'd go, guess what it is, frat boy? <laughs> and I'd go, oh, God, and I'd drink it. And I'd go, I have no idea. He goes, it's watermelon and peppermint. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Never a good one. Actually, the, the, the orange and vanilla creamsicle one was pretty good. He loved to give me that one, and I got it once a year. <laughs> On those shoots, we'd sit there and talk, and he'd always talk about Keith and Diana and Nick, and, and he always smiled. He was always talking about his kids. But where he really smiled was when he talked about Sandy. He absolutely adored Sandy. And it wasn't always what he said, it was how he said it, and with that little twinkle in his eye and that little smile, We'd finish our shoots, and we'd almost be back to the station. I'd got Vetter or Roca or somebody yelling, let's go, let's go. And he'd go, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Go to the market. Go to the market. So we'd go to the market, and he'd hand a homeless guy or one of the musicians five bucks, and he'd go get Sandy flowers. And he'd say, Jimmy, you got to get the woman flowers. got to get her flowers. <laughs> Like most couples, a lot of people, you know, that, that sensitive strammy. Sandy and Ken had a little problem a few years ago, and they actually s separated and got a divorce. And I think that was a really, really, really rough year for Ken. And uh, Sandy tells me even though they were divorced, they spoke and see each other, saw each other every single day. About a year later, they figured things out and they got remarried. And they got remarried by the same judge that granted them the divorce in their chambers with their kids by their side. And you know, I don't think a lot of couples that get divorced, let alone sometimes they don't even talk, but to be able to do that said something to me. So when me and my wife decided to get married, I said, Kenny, I need you to talk at my wedding. and I need you to talk about marriage. And he looked at me and he said, why in the hell would you want me to speak about marriage? And I think if anybody knows the story of Ken and Sandy, you said it, it's the ultimate love story. So that day he walked up to the pulpit in our little church on Mercer Island. And I gotta tell you, I was scared to death of what he was gonna say. <laughs> And our pastor was like, oh my God, Ken Schramm speaking? <laughs> and this is what he said. He said, Sandy and I are not examples of making marriage work, but rather making love endear. To that end, I offer you the following. Know when to put your partner first. Know when to put yourself first. When you fight, fight fair. Know that the person that you love the most can make you the angriest. This was hard to accept from Ken, don't be stubborn, but he said it. And he said, marriage, a commitment to the love you have for each other and knowing that the dream within the dream is yours for the taking. When Ken got sick, it was never more evident of the love that those two shared. Ken was with her, or Sandy was with Ken every day, taking care of him, holding his hand, being there. And Ken gave everything he could back. Ken died one day before their 44th one anniversary. And I guarantee you, if Ken would have woken up the next day, he would have brought her flowers and said, you are the love of my life. Ken Schramm, what a piece of work this guy was, right? A doozy, I called him a doozy, because he was a doozy. I became aware of him in 1992 when I first came to Como. The loudest guy in the room, laughing louder than everybody else, more opinionated than everybody else, stirring up trouble, poking the bear, causing little swirls of controversy all around him. And I thought to myself, that boy ain't right. 
And I came to realize, I, I like to think that he and I had one little thing in common, and that is that we would both rather be annoying than bored. And, and that led to all sorts of things happening in the newsroom. I used to watch him from across the room, and he'd be peering out over his reader glasses. And he's scanning the room, and he's looking for something to start. He's looking for something to do. He's, he's looking for someone to bug and badger. He wants to get something going. He just wants to stir things up. And, and then he'd, you know, he'd spot someone, and you could see him kind of hone in with his eyes, and then he'd take the glasses off. And then he'd use those, those nicknames he had, and he'd say, hey, frat boy, God, who taught you how to dress? Or, hey, punky, who taught you how to white balance? Hey, Garth, when are you gonna start dressing like a grown-up? You know, he, he was like working with Don Rickles, except not as nice, right? <laughs> but the most, amazing thing would happen. Before too long, there would be three or four people around his desk and they'd be discussing something or arguing about something. They'd be cussing. Uh, there'd be a controversy. There'd be arms waving and, and, and Ken's face would light up and he'd turn a little redder and you'd realize that that's when Ken Schramm was happy creating that thing around him. That's what lit him up. If you ever wanted to make a few extra bucks, too late for you now, but uh, all you had to do was wait till spring training, baseball spring training. He was a big baseball fan. And he, he, was, he was a smart guy, but he was bizarrely, irrationally, illogically, uh, he unbelievably always thought that the Mariners were going to be better than they were. <laughs> His optimism for that team was shocking. And so every year during spring training, I'd walk up and I'd say, hey, Ken, how many games do you think the Mariners are going to win this year? And he'd say, they're going to win 92 games. Now, everybody knew they were not going to win 92 games. Nobody in America thought they were going to win 92 games. So I'd say, you want to bet? He goes, yeah, what do you want to bet? Half rack of beer. So we'd bet a half rack of beer. And of course, the Mariners would suck, and they would finish in last place, and he would owe me beer. And my favorite year was, he came up and he said, all right, what kind of beer do you want? <laughs> no, 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 this was after they sucked. This was after the season. So I, I tried to think of the most exotic, hard-to-find beer I could think up off the top of my head, and I said, Grolsch. I want Grolsch beer. It's a Dutch lager. He goes, I never heard of it. And I go, oh, yeah, it's easy. to f You'll find it. It's at the grocery store. <laughs> so for the next two weeks, he would show up to work, and I would say, uh, Ken, do you got my beer? Where's my beer? And he'd say, I, I can't find it. I've been looking around for it. I can't find that crap. And, and, then, <laughs> and this went on for weeks, and then... I, at one point, I said, Jesus, can't come on. You owe me beer. They, lost, they finished in last place. Where's my beer? And he goes, I went to three GD stores last night, and they've never even heard of this gross crap. <laughs> so the next day, the next day, and I swear this is true, he walks up to my desk, makes a beeline for my desk, dumps two six-packs of Bud Light on my desk, and says, kiss my ass, <laughs> and then walked away. We, we, had a, uh, we had a Christmas party one year at my house. And Ken and Sandy were there, and they were in the living room sitting on the couch holding court. Our ex-director, our former director, Steve Wilson, was there, along with the love of his life, Julie. Now, Steve and Julie had been together for about 15 years, but they had never married. And Ken decided that that was a topic to loudly discuss at the party in front of everybody, including people Steve didn't even know. He starts needling him. When are you going to make an honest woman out of her? What's the matter with you? What the hell kind of man are you? She's better than you anyway. And then he says, do it right now. R do you love her? Do you love her? Yes, I do. Do you love him? Yeah, well, yes, I do. Would you like to get married? And she said, yes. She said, do it right now. Next thing you know, I swear to God, there's, there's, there's Wilson on a bended knee at the Christmas party proposing to Julie. It was beautiful. He made that happen. 
of course, Ken's influence is finite, and poor Julie is still waiting for Wilson to actually go through with the wedding, but <laughs> that's a story for a different day. But he had that kind of power, you know? Well, maybe you think that Ken was the way he was because he didn't give a damn about what anyone thought of him, and he was just going to do what he was going to do. But see, I think it was just the opposite. I think he cared very much what people thought of him. I just think he knew that if he could weasel his way under your skin with his churlish charm, that, that, that he would make you love him, that he could find a way to just get, if he just had enough time to get in there, you'd fall in love with him. And, but it had to be on his terms because to him that made it authentic and he was an authentic guy. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think we talk to each other the way we perhaps used to. Um, in line at Starbucks, you see people just locked up on their phones, you know, surrounded by this little wall of technology. But Ken was a guy who understood, I think, that we are here to engage. That's what he was all about, about engaging, interacting, laughing with one another, laughing at one another. He understood that teasing is a form of loving, that you can get away with anything if your heart is true, that when you don't like someone, you give them the business, and when you do like them, you really give them the business that a big smile and thick skin can conquer the world, that it's okay to disagree, but not to disengage, and above all, that people are people, and that strong people should help weak people, and that all of us should, in his words, watch out for each other out there. Here's a look at a good man and a fine, fine career. Shram always reminded me of, like, my favorite uncle. My nickname was Kid. Hey, Kid. Hi, Kid. And he was Shramalama Ding Dong. And growing up at Como, I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be as courageous as he was. I wanted to be comfortable in my skin. I was too young to be there yet. I wanted to be how he was a friend to managers and janitors. And he was a journalist who always, always respected his viewers and his listeners even if they disagreed with him. He changed my career at Como. I auditioned with him for one week to get the job at Northwest Afternoon. Dick Foley wasn't there that week, but I saw him here today. Where are you, Dick? That was, there you are. But Shram, I did the audition with him, and my very first show was sitting on a motorcycle, and so I've got my little Harley rosary on for you, Shram, because he said, just have fun. That's all you've gotta do is have fun. And he would put me at ease, and he would put his guests at ease. And I sat in on his radio show, and he made it look so easy. But I saw him get in hours before to do the research. And I decided I wanted to do radio just like him, despite all the warnings. He didn't say, don't do it, kid. But he did say, you'll see. <laughs> you'll see. <laughs> and he just worked magic with that mic. One day, he was on vacation, and I was filling in. And that was the day Kathy Gertzen died. And Shram showed up. And he said, you're not doing it alone, kid. And he poured his heart and his wisdom and his warmth into every word. And to see that side of Shram when he was sad, like when his brother died, because I always had to go to the Lake City coffee stand too, or when he and Sandy had their short break, it is truly to appreciate the other side of Shram. And if you had a bad day, all you had to do was walk up to a desk because he had a bottle of Jack in the drawer. <laughs> and he'd say, come on over here, kid. And he was my desk mate, too. So every day, he'd come up to my desk, and he'd flick my head, and I'd giggle, and he thought it was funny, even though I knew he was coming. I pretended like I didn't see him coming, and he flicked it every day. I think he, I think he faked spitting on the interns. He did that. <laughs> I was like, oh. At least I got the flick. He would be on his way to town meeting down the hall, and I'd be at Northwest Afternoon, and I'd, my phone would be ringing, and I'd pick it up, and I'd be holding the receiver, and it'd just keep ringing and ringing because he had disconnected the receiver from the phone. And he would turn off the lights if you were in the bathroom. He would turn off the lights if you were in the audio booth trying to record a newscast. And if he wasn't pulling a prank on you, he was dreaming of what his next prank was going to be. Um, now, Scott Hayner, I see you here, and 
forgive me if I have this story wrong, but I got it from Janine Drafts, who's, you know, um, says there was a time when you'd go on vacation and you would have Janine watch your house. And by looking at Scott, you see he's just Mr. GQ, still is, always has, but a bit of a neat freak germaphobe, and Tram knew that. <laughs> and so when Tram found out that Janine was watching his house, he's like, all right, let's take those keys and let's go over there. So I guess the two went over to Hainer's house and Shram managed to make his messy mark everywhere. He went into the milk carton in the refrigerator and he was like, oh. He found your toothbrush and didn't he just go like that with the toothbrush in your mouth? But then they took Polaroids of all of these acts. And then I believe every day, didn't he mail them to you in inner office personal mail? So every day Hainer got another shot of Shram with a toothbrush in the mouth. The day Shram left Como, there was this annoying chirping sound. And it just didn't stop. And it was by my desk. And I'm like, it was like a trapped cricket in a drawer. And we searched and we were ripping apart my desk and trying to find this cricket sound. And Holly Gaunt, our news director, you still hear the cricket, don't you? And somebody at the assignment desk when I was walking over here today said there's still cricket sounds. So I think he planted these cricket things everywhere. Well, I found mine. This magnetic device. Shram stuck this on my desk. And everybody else is still chirping, but mine has died. The battery died. And so there's nobody bugging me at my desk anymore. And I've really never missed that annoying sound more. Uh, I'm John Carlson. I was Ken's counterpart on radio during the commentator's phase of his career. The closest that I can come to describing Shrambo to someone who didn't know him is that he had the talent, the skills, the ethics, the accomplishments of a prize-winning professional journalist and the maturity of a 13-year-old boy. <laughs> Now, on TV, time constraints, structure, format can kind of contain the 13-year-old boy, but on talk radio, live, no scripts, no net, it's wide open, and the 13-year-old boy was on display every day we were on the air. For instance, on radio and TV newscasts, you usually try and make your co-host or co-anchor look good you're working in tandem. Ken and I, on the other hand, would try and make the other guy screw up. Uh, for instance, uh, there was the time he saw me during a commercial break finishing a cell phone call, and I put the phone back in my pocket without turning it off, and right before we went back on the air, he ducked out of the studio for just a second, came back, five minutes later, my phone started ringing on the air, and of course, you go like this, and everyone can hear the phone going off, and Ken's saying, what is this? Your cell phone's going off. This is thoroughly unprofessional. It took about five or six rings to get it. Or the many times when I would be trying to read ad copy during a commercial break, and Ken would be making faces or trying to block the copy or whatnot, so, <laughs> something you usually wouldn't see Greg Herschel doing with Manda Factor. There was the time we were broadcasting live at the Celtic Bayou Tavern on St. Patrick's Day. The owner generously served us drinks on demand. I had an Irish coffee and called it good. Ken had a drink and called it a start. <laughs> at about the 90 minute mark into the three hour program, Ken started mispronouncing words. The thing is, the more he started slurring, the more sense he started to make <laughs> to me. <laughs> and uh, I do believe some history was made that day. That was the last time that someone in our radio group needed a designated driver after the broadcast was over. <laughs> then there was the time that Ken was grousing and complaining about take your kids to work day while my 11-year-old son was sitting next to us because it was take your kid to work day. 
And after a few minutes of what I call shram ranting, the producer said to me in my headphones, take the call on line two. So I punched it up and said, Diana from Bothell, welcome to Coma News Radio. You're on the commentators. <laughs> Whereupon Diana, Ken's Diana, his daughter, said, Dad, you used to take us to work. <laughs> what are you talking about? This was the only time I ever saw Ken with his mouth open and no words coming out. <laughs> Before the end of the segment, another call was coming in. He knew it was one of his sons. He said, don't take that call. He's just going to bust my chops. <laughs> On the way home, my son said, Daddy, wasn't it funny when Ken Schramm's daughter owned him on the radio? <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> then, of course, there was the famous Hummer incident. Uh, Hummer, of course, is a term for a sexual act made politically relevant and famous, more famous, by Monica Lewinsky. Um, anyway, I don't even know what the original topic was that we were discussing on the air, because while most radio shows go from here to here to here, Ken and I frequently would go from here to here to there, over here, and way back over here. So for some reason, the conversation had evolved, if that's the word to use, into whether it's appropriate to use the word Hummer uh, on the air, which was ironic since we were on the air having the conversation. <laughs> Ken and I took opposite sides. Do I really need to tell you what side he was on? <laughs> anyway, we started disagreeing. Voices grew heated. Voices, you know, rapid fire back and forth. And Ken, for some reason, yelled out, yeah, well, I'll give you a Hummer. <laughs> and for one brief microsecond, Everyone in the studio and the booth seemed to be asking themselves, did he just say that on the radio? <laughs> Whereupon I said, what did you just say on the radio? And Ken, for the first time that we worked together, looked confused. <laughs> and with visions of the FCC overhead, we just quickly changed the subject and we moved on. A few months later, Christmas time, Ken and I always exchanged gifts. Ken loved a good game of pool. He had a pool table at the house, and I think that was the year I got him a really nice pool cue. And Ken, being Ken, got me, I'll share it with you here, a Hummer. <laughs> I respected Ken as a colleague, as a journalist, particularly his writing skills. I admired the example he set as a husband to Sandy, as a dad to Keith, Nick, and Diana, grandfather for an entirely too short period of time to Freya. What Ken Schramm did in all aspects of life, he did well which is what defines a life well-led. Kim was also behind the great parrot caper. He got Howard, who was the news director, to agree to babysit someone's parrot and let it sit in the corner of his office with sheets or towels or something covering up the cage. So you know how animals are quiet when the cage is shut, at least the parrot. Ken had secretly slipped a tape recorder under the cage and very wisely left, now I've heard anything from two to three minutes to an hour of silence on the tape, but remember we're talking cassettes, it was more like 15 minutes, of silence. So that as Howard was going on about his news director duties, he got surprised when suddenly from the cage he heard, hello. Hello. 
Now, if you were in a room and a par parrot started talking, you'd be a little thrilled that, well, this parrot can talk, and this, hey, you guys, this parrot's talking. And that was really great until the conversation changed a little bit, and I'll have to clean up the language, but we all know that. When the parrot went from hello to screw you, Howard, <laughs> screw you, Howard, although the parrot's four-letter word was not screw, <clears throat> and the voice sounded suspiciously like Ken Schramm pretending to be a parrot. <laughs> now, one of our colleagues admitted to being gullible enough to thinking that Ken really trained that parrot. <laughs> I have to confess that until I was reading her confession of gullibility in Facebook last week, I thought he had trained that parrot too. <laughs> Sometimes his jokes take a long time to settle. And now I'd like you to close your eyes and imagine you're at a very, very large honors presentation, a very respectful presentation in a big church. It's a dinner banquet and people are speaking, and it's important. And when people speak, you listen. And now imagine as your arms on the table with your guest, you know those tables of 10, and you're paying attention to the speaker, and you're listening, so you don't feel the spoon or fork or knife that's been quietly balanced on the sleeve of your arm jacket. Remember you're in a church and you're in a hard metal seat and the floor is linoleum or concrete or something where when you turn to move that silverware falls to a big clang that everybody in the room can hear and everybody looks at you. That's the kind of stuff Ken would do. We've all been talking about how Ken pulled pranks that only Ken could get away with. He, my nickname was Pollyanna. I don't know how he would ever get away with doing those things, and yet he did. Filling a news anchor's motorcycle helmet with shaving cream. <laughs> Putting shaving cream on the cradle of the phone so that when you answered it, you got it in your face. Walking up to a ranting, we had this executive producer very back, and, and he was kind of a short guy, and I can say that because I'm a short person, so, but he would get into these little bussy rages, and Ken would walk up with a pair of scissors and cut his tie <laughs> in half. During his early years in Spokane, he suspended, this was Halloween, he suspended a spider from fishing line just out of view of the news anchor who was on the air. So the audience couldn't see what was happening. The news anchor knew that there was something over here. Newscast went fine, then they went to break, and the unfazed, very unfazed news anchor took a pencil to poke at that stupid fake spider and nearly had a heart attack when the live hairy tarantula started squirming around in his face. Our eyes may be puffy from crying and from the tears, but our stomachs ache with joy and laughter, remembering Ken's legendary pranks. He would piss us off and then just have us begging for more. Sometimes I think he was reminding us, it's not rocket science, folks. We can't always take ourselves so damn seriously about everything all the time. Focus on the things that really matter. And that's what Ken tried to do. I met Ken the day he started at Como. And I'll always remember keeping his wife Sandy company when he had to work late that night. We sat at Denny's and Diana sat in the high chair and threw spaghetti on the floor. <laughs> and I'll always remember the joy in Ken's voice, Diana, when you and your husband made him a grandpa. I sincerely hope that before Ken died, he understood just how much he was appreciated and admired and respected 
and loved. Some of the people in this room didn't work with Ken, weren't Ken's friends. I've talked to them. They were viewers who were touched by this man. And I also hope he realizes that his pranks are living on as twisted badges of honor. Listen to everybody talking about what he did, and we're so proud that he did it to us. <laughs> and I can hear him right now laughing at our current news director, Holly Gaunt, who has been trying to find that chirping cricket device ever since he planted it in her office sometime before he left. That cricket finally stopped chirping just a few weeks ago. Thanks, Ken. I knew Ken a little differently than the rest of you. He never pulled a prank on me. Because I think I'm meaner than he was. I met him 25 years ago when I was walking the streets. Not as a street walker. Handing out lunches to the people who live unhoused in our community. The people I served loved me. Everyone else hated me. The merchants, the politicians, the police. One day I had Jay walked across the street to hand a double amputee from Vietnam a meal. And an officer of the law followed me and ticketed me. And this white van pulled up. Dents in it. This guy gets out. He jaywalked across the street and he picked me up and hugged me. I thought, who the heck is this guy? He scared the bejesus out of me. Then he proceeded to tell Seattle that I had no compassion. So I continued those 50 lunches a day turn to 500,000 meals a year. And in 2012, there was a new administration who de decided to close me down again. I very rarely abused my relationship with Ken but I called him up and I cried. And he said, she's getting a shrammy. She's not in Seattle anymore. For you, he was a practical joker and your love of your life and your dad. For me, he was a hero. So, if I knew you were saying goodbye, I would have been stronger and held your gaze a little longer. If I knew that you were leaving, I might have found a reason for you to stay. But I could see your face straining
towards that place where it rains only light. It would not have been right to ask you to choose between the earth and the sky. But if I knew you were leaving, I would have said goodbye. begins to hearts that pound in unison to lights remember when time and space were almost one so dance with me my friend life will come full circle until
like to invite Ken's cousins up. It's so very nice to be here and see all of Ken's friends and, and family and some distant relatives um, here with us today. Um, my name is Jan Rethmeyer, and this is my husband of 45 years, Dennis. Um, it's, it's been wonderful listening to all these people and coworkers talking about their experiences with Ken, which are extremely different from mine. <laughs> <laughs> In case you didn't know it, Ken was born in, in New York City, as I was. I'm sure you all know it, though, now. He and I were the firstborn children of two sisters, and they had three older brothers. There were just seven months between us, he being the older, of course. While he enjoyed the close proximity of our grandparents, my parents relocated to New Jersey when I was about one year old. We got together for birthdays and holidays and other important family events. My family eventually moved to California, making those occasions rather sparse and spread out. When he was about 17 years old, Ken's family moved to Southern California. And believe it or not, we graduated in the same class in high school. Oh my God. <laughs> that was not an easy transition for any teenager. But as I remember it, Ken did not complain, and he made the best of a bad situation. It was a character-building opportunity for Ken in retrospect. And I'm sure that our classmates really couldn't quite figure him out either, because he was a prankster with his New York accent, cracking jokes and pulling pranks constantly. As in most cases, after that, we struck, up, we, we struck out on our own paths in life. And we didn't see each other very often at all for quite a while as we were both raising our families and um, Dennis and I were spent a number of years in the Midwest. But about 15 years ago, we and our spouses connected and have enjoyed a very special close relationship for which we were all very thankful. On one of our visits to Seattle, Ken spent an entire day showing us his favorite sites, and it became clear to us just how special his place was here in Seattle. He was recognized at nearly every stop we made. I kept thinking, why are all these people turning and looking at us? Is something unzipped, or what's, <laughs> what's going on here? Well, I finally realized just what it was. They started coming up and asking, are, are you Ken Schramm? And I thought, well, thank goodness. It could have been a whole lot worse than that. Although our political leanings are probably quite different, we cannot help but respect his honest and forthright approach to everything that he did in life. Dennis.
We're up here for some really important reason, and it's not because Jan and Ken were born six months apart in the Bronx, and it's not because they are cousins and I'm the cousin outlaw or in-law. Sandy paid me the greatest compliment that a person can get when we arrived. And a couple of weeks ago, she called and asked if we could share some of our thoughts about our history with them. She said, you are our friends. And when someone can say that to you from the bottom of their heart, it really is meaningful. We love Sandy and we love Ken. And we learned how to say, I love you to each other a long time ago. I heard other people mention that today. And when you can reach that point, man to man, woman to woman, and man and woman to each other, it's an incredibly deep and meaningful relationship. And we are thankful for that. I'd like to look at a note or two and share, and share some memories. Uh, by the way, my, nick, my nickname, I think, is Horse Pucky. <laughs> Why do you think my nickname is Horse Pucky? It's because, like Jan said, politically, Ken and I didn't always see the same. We did agree on one thing, though, that we found out about not long ago, and that had to do with breastfeeding in public. <laughs> Although we're not in the KOMO audience, I understand that that was one that wasn't greeted with uh, resounding applause in the entire Como community. Uh, we first met in about 1972 uh, in Canoga Park, California. Our first child had been born, and we were at Jan's parents' house, and there was this beautiful woman with kind of red hair in a red dress on the other side of the pool. And I said, I wonder who that is. Oh, that's Ken Schramm's wife. Like, wow, she must be getting ready to go into public broadcasting or the media or something like that. And Jan said, no, 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 Ken, Ken's the one that's going to get into broadcasting. And I said, that guy? <laughs> Do you think he's good looking enough? <laughs> At any rate, uh, that's where it started. It was 1972. And um, we, we saw each other again at uh, the Reinertsen's 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, and the relationship deepened further. Uh, and then when Jan's father passed away in 2000, uh, Ken drove down to uh, Marietta and was at the funeral. And you guys stayed at our house, I believe. Yes, exactly. And then another funeral we saw Ken at, and that was Gene Schramm's up in uh, Pleasanton, California. And then there were the trips that we made to Seattle. I think the first one was about five years ago when Jan was speaking about walking through Pike's Market. Oh, I love your position on that, Mr. Schramm. That was really pleasant and uh, quite memorable. But what was even more memorable than that was going back to their home and looking at that beautiful old jukebox. Those of you who haven't seen it, it is an absolute beauty and it still plays music. And guess what we did? We danced. I think I danced with a dog, too. <laughs> At any rate, it's been a, a wonderful, incredible relationship. I love Ken. Jan loves Ken. We love the Schramm family. And we are so honored to have been asked to participate uh, in such a memorable uh, recognition ceremony for, for Ken's life. Um, in Jan 
might have some parting words? Because of the caring and tender person that he was, Ken Schramm will be sorely missed. But greater than the sorrow from his death is the joy and the happiness that he spread in his life. Rest in peace, Ken. We love you. Gonna invite all the SRAM kids up to the stage. Um, for those of you I uh, don't know, um, I'm Diana Saltkill, used to be SRAM. I am the firstborn. Um, so this is just so overwhelming. Um, my mommy doesn't want to come up and speak um, today. It's just, she's just feeling everybody's love and support and it means so much and she acknowledges every word that everybody sent and appreciates it more than we could ever say and a huge huge thank you to all of our friends in the Como family who helped organize this and make it happen um, my dad was on TV my whole entire life. Um, it was never a big deal to me. He was just my dad. And when he passed away and we started talking about this, the public memorial and I realized how big it was and he wasn't just this huge presence in our own lives. He was, a huge presence in so many lives. And in a way, it's so comforting to see how many lives he was such a big part of. And it's so lovely to see you all here. And thank you for being here. Um, so I, I'm going to read from something my father wrote, because um, he is far more eloquent than I am. And um, just a disclaimer ahead of time, nobody needs to cover small children's ears <laughs> or anything like that. Um, we, we found um, a partially finished, finished um, manuscript. Um, it's called The Beginner's Guide to Creative Profanity. <laughs> and uh, the prologue is, in, e in every person's life, there is the need to effectively communicate with others, to express, express pleasure and approval, unhappiness and dissatisfaction in a manner befitting the situation. Too often, many of us find ourselves at a loss for appropriate words in situations that require only a nominal ability to be glib and garrulous. We remain mum when we should be malicious, silent when we are called upon to be sagacious. It is truly unfortunate that profanity has been relegated to such a distasteful form of expression in the English-speaking world. In the past, this has been due to the puritanical nature of social standards. More recently, profanity has just never enjoyed the focus of reformation. It has never been afforded its correct stature in the parlance of our modern world. Used only in the basest of forms, few people have discovered profanity as an inventive means of expanding verbal skills. Profanity can be profound. <laughs> Memorize the contents of these pages. Use what you find here without discrimination. Become a pioneer in the dimensional use of a language form too long neglected and ill-used. Like all pioneers, you may suffer some disdain and could be so socially ostracized in certain circumstances, but that is a small price to pay for being at the threshold of, of a bold new verbal frontier. Besides, they will love you in the locker rooms. 
We live in a time that requires a nimble mind. It is no longer sufficient to bluster your way out of verbal confrontations using hackneyed phrases and trite exclamations. Ours is a pseudo-sophisticated society and we can no longer rely on once bold utterances that used to signify nonconformity and disregard for acceptable forms of speech in previous generations. The next para para paragraph I, I need to summarize. Um, he gives an example of a, of a phrase that you might utter to somebody who has angered you in some fashion that you would use to dismiss them and then suggests a far more colorful um, expansion of that phrase. I will leave that up to your imaginations. I'm sure that some of you have a pretty good idea of what that might be. <laughs> and so now there is a locution with a lilting sense of the absurd and immediately con conjures up an image that curdles the mind. In using that remark, you convey to others that you have a mental capacity which allows you to pursue life's subtle degeneracies. It says that you take pride in your profanity. Additionally, such an idiom will also serve to help you stand out at social functions. Members of the opposite sex will immediately take notice of you, wondering to themselves, who is that person and who invited them here? <laughs> which I think is a question many of you asked when you met my dad for the first time. <laughs> Fortunately, being the only girl, I was, I was spared the pranks. Um, I did get to sit back and enjoy him, him torture um, all of his sisters, be it my mother's sisters or his own sister and his niece. Um, but. The big light has gone out in all of our lives, and I'm going to miss the hell out of you, Daddy. Thank you. Wow. It's really nice seeing, seeing everybody here. It's uh, really moving um, to see all the lives that, uh, that dad touched. Um, I sat down last night and um, was going to try and put together some words. Um, and after sitting there for an hour uh, with nothing written down, um, I decided just to wing it. Um, what, what can you honestly, how, how do you honestly put together a group of thoughts in one concise statement for one of your best friends who just recently passed away. And coming here today, um, I was still unsure of how I was going to express things um, until I saw, you know, until people started coming up here to speak. And watching everybody and seeing everybody tell their stories um, and how Dad was able to touch them, to, to bond with them. Um, his nicknames, uh, he had them for us too. I was Pal, Nick was Bacha Galoop, and Diana was Munch. <laughs> Everybody had it. Mom was San. Uh, he had an innate way of finding a little something in each person to grab a hold of it and connect with you. Everybody he met. Uh, he would remember, you know, the most minute details and uh, was able to, you know, the next time he saw you would, would remind you of these things and it just it brought you that much closer to him. My favorite, one of my favorite things was that dad had like five sayings. He had an answer, so how you doing today, Ken? Um, passing gas and seeing bubbles. Or, how you doing today, Ken? <laughs> uh, feeling like dog doodle on the lawn of life. <laughs> or, my favorite was, he had this one saying when he, when he was threatening to, uh, you know, beat somebody up or something like that. He'd say, I'm going to kick your butt up so far up your shoulder blades that you're going to look like Quasimodo. <laughs> and that was his one, one thing. And he never changed it, and he never varied from it. And he always thought it was so clever. But when you hear it for 33 years, it becomes pretty, 
pretty redundant. <laughs> and that, that reminds me of a story when, when Dad and I had the opportunity to take a trip and go down to spring training to watch the Mariners for like three or four days. And when we got down there, it was hot and he was complaining, obviously, because there wasn't any AC in the outdoor stadium. And uh, he wanted, you know, he, he was heckling the ball players, and he would, we'd have to go out, you know, to the edge of the, of the park so we could have a smoke um, and then come back in and, you know, heckle the ball players a little bit more. But the best part of the trip was uh, it wasn't the baseball. I wasn't going to see the games. It wasn't, you know, um, sitting in the stands. Uh, we decided to take a trip uh, on one of the days to go down to Tombstone in Arizona. Uh, anybody who knows my dad knows that he is a huge, huge Western fan. Uh, I mean, he huge. He sits, that's all he did at home, sat there and watched old 50s Western movies that we'd all hate. <laughs> but we loved him for it. <laughs> so we go down there and uh, we're touring around. It's a great, it's a fun little town, you know. And he's just having the time of his life. We took a shot of whiskey in the bar. We went to the theater and saw where all the bullet holes were. We went and saw the really crappy, you know, acting job that the people put on for the, the, the shoot at the OK Corral. Uh, and after we left, uh, we, you know, we had some magnets. And it's called The Town Too Tough to Die. So for the next four or five days, that's all he said was, The Town Too Tough to Die. <laughs> And he would say it just constantly. That, and he's like, you know what? I have a new word for Arizona. Arizona ugly. And he would say, man, that's just Arizona ugly. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Dad? But anyways, the town too tough to die. Um, it, it, I was thinking about that. And it, my dad is, was a tough man. He was tough in a spiritual manner. He was tough in an emotional manner. He was tough in a physical manner. He was just, he was my idol. And uh, growing up under him, um, you know, I couldn't ask for a better father and a better role model to grow up under. And he will always be the man too tough to die. For those who don't know, I'm Nick Schramm, the youngest of the Schramm children. And I've been fortunate enough so far in my life to not to have been to uh, too many funerals. But I gotta say there's something kind of funny about this one in that of all the funerals I've been to, they all tend to focus on just the virtues of the deceased. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're hearing a lot more about his faults and his virtues. And r really, I think there's something special about that because I can tell you for all the mischief that you've heard about from him at work and out on the streets, he was just the same way at home. He was the same in public and in private. And to me, that just the paints a picture of a man who couldn't be anyone other than himself all the time. And I think there's something really special about that. And I think the best way we can honor his memory is to try to strive to do that in our own lives. Just be yourself and be the best person you can Put yourself out there. Tell the people you love that you love them every day, no matter how much you love them. Your friends, your family, random people that make you happy on the street, just let them know that they did something for you. Um, and uh, I mean, this may have been uh, more of a surprise to some of us than others, but I would like to share something I wrote in anticipation of this um, about two years ago. It's uh, called Other Days. Some days, death means little to me, a passive end to one of the universe's more curious phenomena. I see it walking through houses, talking to children, coddling fauna and be both beloved and alone. I see it camped on corners, roadsides, in fields, and I think of it as it thinks of me, nothing. Some days, death rakes the flesh from my bones, jagged, uneven strips drawn out by grimy fingers and cinched by a yellowing maw ever swallowing, ever unsated. I see it in the faces of loved ones, stalking shadows under eyes, waiting to pluck the next chunk of meat from my withering smile till there is no vestige but that of scar tissue. Other days, death stares back at me, straight-eyed and grinning in my mirror. So th those are the days that it means least of all. Thank you all for coming out and remembering my father.
means a lot to all of us. Perhaps love is like a resting place Shelter from the storm It exists to give you comfort It is there to keep you warm And in those hours of trouble When you are most alone The memory of love will see you home Perhaps love is like a window Perhaps an open door It invites you to come closer It wants to show you more And even if you lose yourself and don't Memories of love will see you through And love to some is like a cloud To some as strong as steel For some way of living For some a way to feel And some say love is holding on and some say letting go And some say love is everything And some say they don't know Perhaps love is like the ocean Full of conflict, full of pain a fire when it's cold outside, thunder when it rains. If I could live forever and all my dreams come true, my memories of love will be of you. is carrying on the tradition of irreverence <laughs> while people are up on the stage. As we come to the close of today's service, another heartfelt thank you from the Schramm family and Sandy to everyone who participated for you all showing up and sharing to Como for putting on the shindig, to everyone who spoke, to the fabulous flowers, to the people who work behind the scenes, our sound people who are fabulous. I threatened them prior to getting on the stage about not shutting off my guitar. To Jen and Andrea and Paula who put together the program. Um, to Keith for allowing me to sing Alleluia with him. But a special thanks. You probably haven't noticed this. I over emote a little bit. <laughs> a special thanks to Sandy and to Keith and Diane and Nick. Having a personality in your family that is so intense 
is not easy. And you shared him with us so graciously and generously. You shared him with Seattle. And we love you. As we move to close this circle, this sacred space that we have created with our love, we say, Mother, Father, God, Creator, Maker. This child of yours, Ken Schramm, stands before you with all of his life lessons, all of the experiences from this spoke on the wheel, and he lays them at your feet as an offering, a sacrifice, a gift, a blessing. He is worthy simply because he has breathed the sacred breath of spirit, your breath, that which connects each one of us on this planet. This child, son, husband, lover, lifetime companion, father, mentor, grandfather, brother, uncle, friend, colleague, prankster, hero. This Ken Schramm. Enfold him in wings of life. Embrace him in arms of love. Lift him into the light. Blessing all those who have loved him and shared the journey with him and all those whom he has loved so that our hearts will continue to break wide open. And the people say, Amen. Aho, Ani Ani. There is a song. It's on your programs. There's a little story about the song. It's called On Eagle's Wings and it's written by Jean Michael Jonkis. It was one of Ken's and Sandy's most meaningful hymns together. And Sandy played it frequently in those last days in hospice. And she was singing the refrain of this song at the top of her lungs when Ken took his last breath. So we're inviting you to sing this song at the top of your lungs, and Ken will hear it. So I'm going to teach you the refrain, and then you're going to sing it back with me, and then we're going to sing it really loud. Okay, now. 
now sing it like you mean it. He will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. My rock in whom I trust, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand. Ken said to me, what is your favorite song to sing? And I said, whatever I'm singing. That's my favorite song at that moment. And he said, but what's the favorite song you've written? And I said, the one that I am writing, because all the ones that I've already written, they've already been born. It's the next thing that has to happen. And then I said to him, What's your favorite song that I sing? I have nine albums. I expected something. <laughs> and he said, I love it when you sing Amazing Grace. Did you want to come up here with me? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I am found Twas blind But now I see Twas grace that brought me Save thus far and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear? The first believed. Do you remember? No. Do you know the words? You going to wait all the way to the end of the song? Yeah. Why don't we just get there? <laughs> 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 I, I, so 
I love hearing you sing. <laughs> when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining. Then when we first begun. So now we're just going to ask all of you to sing this. Amazing grace. closing music because Ken was just bad to the bone. 